Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking your time out to come to Backbone. Uh, this whole entire session is just an hour. We're going to be talking specifically about the bivocational leader. Uh, my name is Dion Gates. I am a bivocational leader. Uh, I'm also a seed director for World Impact. If some of you, how many of you are familiar with World Impact? Okay, good. A few, a little bit. I see some hands shaking there. Uh, World Impact is a missional organization that resources urban pastors. So we, we pride ourselves on going into communities where they're underserved and under-resourced, finding the leaders that are there, and then making sure that they stay on top of their game and continue to provide the type of care and help spiritually uh, to our communities. And so I think this particular conference is, is special because it gives a platform to what's going on in the city, in the urban centers. And so today with our conversation, we're going to be talking specifically about being a bivocational leader. Uh, just so I can get a sense of who's in the room with me, uh, how many bivocational leaders do we have in the room? Okay, so you're working and doing other things. Uh, anybody thinking about becoming a bivocational leader? Got you. Uh, anyone who's done that and says, I'm just trying to recover from it. <laughs> All, right. All right, so good. This, this may have some therapy in there. I see one hand back in the back. There's a sense of therapy we'll have with this. Uh, I will tell you at the very onset that uh, I am not Dr. Dates. I had some people ask me. I had two people ask me that right after he got through speaking. I would figure that we were wearing something totally different. I got more gray in my beard than he does, uh, and he's better looking than I am. But we're going to really uh, take some time to just go through a couple of scriptures. The scriptures themselves won't be anything that you've never heard. Uh, but I think at the second portion of my time with you that we'll be talking a little bit more about some practical things that you may be able to take away from me being by vocation as long as I have been. And, and I think that we may have some good dialogue. So then there will be a little bit of Q&A as we wind up so we can have some, some conversation. You may ask questions or give some feedback or some things that you've done or some best practice you have. We wanna, I, want, I believe that there's a lot of wisdom in the room and that you know, I'm not just the subject matter expert of all time, but there's some good things that we can learn from each other. And so if you would, please, let's pray, and then we'll get, into, we'll get started. Father, we thank you so much for your presence here in the room. We thank you so much for what you're doing in this conference, the gospel in our cities. We believe that you're doing great things among the urban centers of our country, and we want to continue to be a part of the process. We want to be a part of your team as you continue to revitalize areas that government can't fix. You revitalize areas and families and communities that, that just wishing won't get done. So you've equipped us, and now God, prepare us for what you have called us to do in this time. Do something in us and during our time that only you can get the credit for. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so my story is that I'm 41 years old, and I have known nothing but bivocationalism as it relates to ministry. Uh, my wife and I started pastoring uh, or leading in a, in a serious way right after we got married in 1997. So from 1997 to the present day, I've worked another job, but also held a level of uh, uh, responsibility within my local church that would require extra hours, I would say the upwards of 20 hours a week to make sure that I was effective in whatever it is that I was responsible for in our urban church that we attended. Uh, uh, I started law enforcement in 2001, and I just finished up 17 years of law enforcement. Somewhere in between that 17-year period, in 2009, I started in my own church called Mending Place, where I moved from a secondary position to being the lead pastor and the founding pastor of the church that I pastor in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, you think that that's something, right? But that's, that's nothing, because I also was volunteering heavily with World Impact, the organization that I'm standing here before you as a city director right now. I will say that in all doing all of that I learned a lot about capacity, about okay. tempo, about pace, about how we set ourselves up for the long game and what really got the glory that God gets out of it. I will say that at the beginning I was uh, jealous and envious of uh, suburban partners and friends who you know they had full-time salaries and they were you know full-time ministry they were going to their office and just getting a chance to you know drink lattes and, and <laughs> purify water and no I'm just being funny I don't want to characterize it like that but I was really seriously praying to God God why is it you got me you know why you got me working I'm still working I feel like I'm faithful I'm doing all the things you want me to do but why 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 and uh, recently I realized 
that what I feel like God is doing in the urban centers and what he's wanting to do really within a lot of different people groups is really say, you know what, why not us take some of the burden and load off of what we've been doing in the church by taking and removing some of the salary load and, and also, as we get into this, really connecting with people where they're at. And many of you have heard this probably before, that when you get involved with ministry and you only hang out with Christians, sometimes you can get a little siloed and you can get groupthink. I think working and having a job where you work with, with other people groups and people who are dealing with real life issues, uh, it prevents us from getting a little glazed over. But specifically, uh, I've been married 21 years, got three children, I've got a 19-year-old, 18-year-old, and a 16-year-old, and all of this is going on, as you can imagine, while I'm pastoring and policing, and then now while I'm uh, the city director. So I want to jump into a story I think that can kind of help us put some, some wheels on this. We're going to go into Nehemiah, uh, the first chapter, so if you have your device or scripture, uh, we're going to just read a couple verses. I picked a couple verses out because I know you don't want me to read the whole story to you because some of you are very familiar with this. This is what the kind of good thing about coming to a Bible conference because you don't have to necessarily tell the entire story. You can just kind of pick stuff out and people can kind of fill in the, the gaps from their, their own personal study. Nehemiah chapter 1, and I'm just going to read uh, verse 10 and 11 of the first chapter, and then I'm going to read verse 1 of chapter 2. I've got the scripture already on the... Uh, the whiteboard for you. If you wanted to follow along, please feel free to do that. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV, and then uh, we'll move on down the road here. But I, I feel like Nehemiah gives a great picture of what it looks like to have a burden, but not necessarily have the freedom to just do that and that alone. You know, and many of us in the room have burdens. We've got burdens for things. God's put something on our heart. He's put a people group or a, an issue, an, an ill, societal ill on our heart. And we can't just walk away from it. And I know that we may be hanging shingles right now, but I can't help but think about that. You know, I know I may be X, Y, Z, but I'm really thinking about what God has placed on my heart. And it just drives me to where even when I have a free time, a free moment or extra time, I'm pushing the boundaries. I'm stretching myself and I'm doing extra so that I can really answer the call of what God has put on my heart. So it's just not career, but it's call. And that's so important. So number one, we see Nehemiah in, in Nehemiah 1, 10 and 11 he says, they are your servants and your people. He's praying. Nehemiah is ending his prayer here. And he says, whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of, the, of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. Him, of course, talking about this man, talking about King Xerxes. And also he finishes with this one phrase that I think holds us together. I was a cupbearer to the king. Now, I thought initially when I read that, like, why is that so important that he throws that in there out of the whole story, out of all the things that he's heard about the ruins of Jerusalem and the walls being torn down and needing to be rebuilt and the, the state of what used to be a, a sprawling and beautiful metropolis is now destroyed. And he ends with that phrase at the end of the first chapter. And uh, second, second chapter, verse 1, picks up like this. It says, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought to him or brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. And he just basically then gives a definition of what his job title and description was even when he is in captivity. And I kind of like to call this idea that God calls bartenders to be builders. <laughs> oh, my gosh, right? It sounds like God to do that, right? To call a bartender... The guy who's pouring the wine, uh, if you look at it in the King James when it says cupbearer, it just means someone who, uh, they call it like uh, to water, the, uh, the waterer, the irrigator, someone who, who makes those things that are dry, wet, keeps the water flowing. And, and so you can imagine uh, his role with being around the king all the time as the, the bartender or the cupbearer of the king in the King James, that... When he hears the story of what's going on in his urban community, his old hometown, the place that he used to do life, things had changed. But his heart was pricked. He, he was now in a role that he would figure that, you know what, many of us say, well, I'm a bartender, 
not an architect. You know, who, who am I to build walls? You know, I pour drinks. You know, if he wanted a Coors, then, then call me. But if you want someone to rebuild a city, then that's really not my job description. And I feel God pulling and pricking other people in the same way as he pulled and pricked Nehemiah. That at some point, there has to be a burden. There has to be a burden. So if you're looking for points, number one point is burden. There has to be a burden. That if you don't have a burden, then going into our urban centers and our urban environments is not for you. It can't be just a chic thing. It can't be just a cool thing. It can't be a thing that, you know, what I see other people doing it. And they got some really cool buildings in that area that I can, you know, we could change and manipulate. And then we can really find ourselves being a part of the, the in crowd. You know, they're revitalizing downtown. So, you know what, we should be a part of that revitalization because it'd be a really good opportunity for us to get some visibility. We have to realize that without a burden, the, the pressures of being bivocational will cause you to fold. They'll bury you, right? You've got to have a call. It can't just be cool. It can't be convenient. But without a call, without the burden, this is going to be maybe one of the worst outings you'd ever experience. Now, I know that there's plenty of people who've done it, and we know the scripture says you've got to put your hands to the file and don't look back, and, and you've got to count up the cost, and all those things are relevant. But if you can't say right in the very first beginnings of your, your intentions that, man, I would do this for free, which if any of you know, there's probably if many of you are by vocation, you're doing something free in that whole thing. How many of you are working for, or are you being underpaid? Oh, don't, don't, I shouldn't say that. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all would raise our hand. Y'all being underpaid. But there's some area of your career or your call that you're not necessarily being paid what you could be so that you could do what God wants you to do. Right? That happens. And we see this with, with Nehemiah. He's like, First and foremost, I want you to know that I was nothing special. I was just somebody who answered the call. The burden was too great for me to ignore it. And I, and I think he tells us that by letting us know that he was, hey, listen, I was a bartender. I'm just, I'm just pouring drinks. But when I hear some things, it keeps me up at night. It's my holy discontent, the thing that calls me into action, and it motivates me. Even when I'm tired or I feel ill-equipped, I still answer the call. And so... He's called into the building. Nehemiah is not in the construction science business. It's not a part of his resume. And some of us may be saying the same. Well, there's a lot of things that, I, that would disqualify me because I don't have a lot of experience. My experience may be in telemarketing, but I really feel like God's called me to be an evangelist. My experience may be in baking, but I feel like God has really called me to be an apostle and church, plant, church, plant churches in urban centers across this country. You can, you can be on a career path one day and a call from God comes and you find yourself doing things you never thought you would do. And you would you'd be ashamed to show your resume when you go and knock on doors or have conversations with people because that's just like God to send someone who would say that my glory is going to be what's sufficient for you because you won't be able to take any of the credit. This is the perfect reason why we see the call of Nehemiah and it's being relevant to what God's called the bivocational leader to be that we have to be stirred by the fact that God has called us not only to have a burden, but to build. We've got to be thinking about that, right? So that's point number two. These, these are all going to be B's. So if you're wondering, I'm going all the way down B's. <laughs> burden and build. You don't have to have all the knowledge to build in God's kingdom. That's what I love about it. You don't have to have the perfect strategy to build in his kingdom. Uh, I, I was a lot of years that I spent in life thinking, you know what, I... I I can't be effective because there is no way God could be calling a guy like me. I don't even have, at, at the time when I was getting ready to start my church, I didn't have a clear vision. Anybody ever start a church and you're like, I, I think this is what it's kind of like. I, he wants me to start this ministry and I don't, I mean, I can't articulate it. I can't put it in a sentence. There's nothing that's bite-sized about it. It's kind of sloppy. And, and I like that Nehemiah gets started on the process of going before he has well, who's all going to go and what part of the wall they're going to work on and, and how am I going to get all these resources? He's in the process of praying first and foremost. And then he realizes that the building must start. The burden always leads us into action. The burden cannot be ignored. It always leads us to the point of building, building something. And even if it's just not you building it as a, as a pioneer, you're going to help revitalize what has been or you're going to partner with somebody else to build for God's glory, for his kingdom. Amen.
That's what God called us to do. But when you think about burdens, you think about building, then I want to add a third B, and there's going to be a fight. Right? The brawl. There's always going to be a fight, and as those of you who know the story, we continue to move on, and as Nehemiah gets permission, he gets letters, he goes back to the wall, and there's people who show up who want to distract him and or kill him to prevent him from accomplishing God's plan and call on his life. And I would be, I'd be completely wrong if I wouldn't tell you that the same will happen to you as a bivocational leader. As God commissions you to go into those particular environments where others would walk around, others would want to fly over, others would want to ignore the ruins in our urban centers, that God called you right in there to ground zero to work, even then, what you see is a good job, I'm going to do a good thing, there's going to be people who will assassinate, want to assassinate you in the process of rebuilding, especially if the building is going to be for God's glory. And so you've got to be a brawler, which means you're going to have to learn to fight. How many of you ever been in a fight? Just want to? This, I forgot this is a Christian organization. This is a Christian conference, right? Okay. No, no, no. Listen. I mean, a real live fight. You know, fighting is not always the prettiest thing. It's not always the prettiest thing. I know sometimes we have these images in our mind of what we would do in a fight. You know, like... You know, someone makes you mad and you start thinking about what you do to them physically. Or am I the only one? Okay, there's some other people, yeah. And I'm going to do this. And it always looks like a movie montage. Like you got slow motion and you're, you're seeing it all coming before it actually happens. But the truth of the matter is fighting is ugly. It's ugly. But somebody's going to have to fight. We have to realize that if we're going to accomplish what God called us to, brawling is necessary. In fact, it would be ordained by God because we realize that the heavens suffer violence and the violent take it by force. That there's so much violence going on in the unseen realm that we realize that what we see naturally is just the, the, the uh, uh, offset or offshoot of what's taking place in the spiritual realm. So Nehemiah encounters this brawling spirit that comes from Sanballat, Tobias, and a couple of other people who are hanging out, spying on him, and wanting to attack him. So much so, it changes the very way he does ministry. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot do ministry like you used to if you want to be bivocational and in city centers. It's going to require more. It's going to require a change in philosophy, a change in strategy. It's not going to be the same that you may have done in other seasons or in other places. If you're going to be effective in urban centers, you're going to have to fight with grit. And your grit is going to have to exceed the grit of the people you're ministering to. Not just the ones you fight, but the ones you minister to. How many of you have ever felt like the people you're ministering to are the people you're fighting? <laughs> okay. I know that. If you go in and you're dealing with people who are hardened, if iron sharpens iron, the harder substance shapes the softer substance. If you're going to go into hard environments, it's going to require that you develop a level of grit. A level of intensity for you to survive and to make the impact that God really wants to make in those particular areas. It doesn't mean that you get mad and get mean and you get, you know, the type of person that's, you know, dogmatic or you're disrespectful. I'm just saying that when we're dealing with people who are dealing with long-term issues and, and acute issues, you cannot play it safe or soft. You're going to have to make sure that you come in pretty, pretty hard by the fact that uh, it's going to take extra, extra uh, I would say, like the scripture I'm going to read in Ezekiel, there's going to take a flint head, a hard head, for you to be able to deal with people. You ever bumped heads with somebody? You ever heard that term? I bumped heads with my boss, I bumped heads with my boyfriend, girlfriend, bumped heads with my wife, bumped heads with somebody. This bumping of heads, uh, normally the harder head wins, right? So if you ever needed an excuse to be hard-headed, I just gave it to you spiritually, scripturally. You got it. Hard head wins. But at the end of the day, we do it for the breaches, right? So you see me going right down the line here. We do it for the breaches because these breaches prevent us from creating safety. There no bre where there's breaches, that means that not only people can come and go whenever they want to in a natural sense, but spiritually the enemy can come and go whenever he wants to. So God brings men and women into places to deal with breaches generationally, culturally, systemic issues, 
He calls us to come in and deal with breaches so that the enemy won't be able to use gates to come in and out as we may think as easy as he used to in some seasons. So you're automatically first and foremost going to close breaches. You're closing strongholds. You're closing poor patterns of behavior. You're teaching uh, biblical truths and you're causing people to stand upright and walk upright and no longer be slaves to sin and sinful patterns of behavior. And that means that the enemy is going to be on your tail hot and heavy. Hot and heavy. So what's some practical things that I've done in my, lo- my life and my role uh, as a pastor and a lay leader within the local church, the local urban church? Well, uh, I-, I would tell you that I was unbalanced for many years. I just, I just thought that I could never get tired. You know, I thought that I could never, there was nothing that was going to ever happen in my life that was going to cause me to quit. And I wasn't like the other guys or gals. I was just stronger. I was just better. I was just better equipped to do this. And, you know, I could just never see myself quitting or giving up or giving out. Until about 2014. And my marriage started shaking and rattling and rolling. And I felt like I was going to just throw away the ministry, uh, get rid of law enforcement career, and just completely throw it all away. And it was a tough time because I didn't realize what was taking place, but the enemy had pushed me so far. You know, I was going so far, 90 miles an hour in every area of my life, and I got to this point break, and my wife was yelling and screaming like, hey, you're, you're, this is, you're going too far. You know, you've done too much. you got to bring it back in. you got to slow down. Uh, and I didn't realize that. I, was, I thought it couldn't happen to me. And I didn't do the things that were necessary to prepare myself, and that's one reason I was going to talk about pace. Because without a good pace, you're gonna you you there's listen there's gonna always be an issue, right? There's gonna always be something that needs to be fixed. Always gonna be something that will require your attention, or maybe just a few extra hours, or maybe just one more phone call, or maybe just one more meeting, or maybe just one more you can get the picture, and just one more becomes a lot more, and before long, we'll find ourselves buried under just one mores. And that's never what God intends for us to do. So I'm encouraging you to really talk about pace, think about pace, and think about pace with your significant other. Think about pace with your family. Think about pace with your team. Think about pace with your, other, with your pastor, your, your mentor, your, whoever it is that may speak life into you. You've got to have a conversation around pace. Because what we see uh, Nehemiah doing, and if you go back and study it, there was rotations. Some worked while others fought. Now, they did sleep in their clothes. I'm not recommending that you do that. <laughs> Don't sleep in your clothes. But I will say that there was a rhythm there that was developed that was sustainable, and the project did have an end date, right? That when the wall is completed, then the project is done. And they didn't probably focus on other things, but you need to know that, that nothing goes on indefinitely, and there should be things that come to an end in some season. If you've got projects or things on your heart that have no smart measurables to where there's a time bound nature to it that that comes to an end there's a point of rest that's one area that you probably need to look and see that that may be an unraveling of your bivocational nature if there's everything is always and always and forever you can't you can't be that way so i've got a couple things on here that that i'm going to add and i'm just going to say these are leverage points because we talked about leveraging what what are some ways that we can leverage our bivocational by vocationalism. And number one, I think it just you have to be hard. There's going to be some things that you're going to have to develop uh, a, a level of hardness to be able to work in urban environments. Now what you'll see, and you may be aware of this, that you have some people who they think it's cool to geographically be in urban environments, but they're really not urban leaders. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Do we get that? To where it's, it's the chic thing to do now, right? You know, we're hip. We're going to be in that area, but we really don't have any any edge that would allow us to minister to the people that we're we're actually doing life amongst. Doesn't mean that you don't serve, right? Doesn't mean that you don't serve in your community, but it may not mean that you have an opportunity or a voice to speak to them because we have to be hard, right? We got to have a we got to have some hardening. If you don't, the people that you go to serve will eat you up. They'll chew you up, burn you out. One of the good things about me being from my community and this community I serve in is that I know 
I know them, right? I know what's going on. I, I know the, the group. And so I don't have to be, uh, they can't do me, put me off, make me, you know, play my heartstrings. But I can be aware of what's going on and I can lead this way. Naturally, by my, just by nature, I'm not an empathetic person. I'm kind of not as empathetic as most. Maybe that's law enforcement. Maybe that's, you know, something else. But I don't know. That's what it is. I think that, uh, secondly, one of the things that you leverage because you're bivocational is you don't have enough time. You have to have strategic partnerships. Oh, yeah. You got to. We were mobile. Uh, the church was mobile from 2009 to 2015. 2009, 2015. So we were mobile. Anybody else been mobile church? Tear down, set up, tear down, set up. We were tearing down, setting up, tearing down, setting up. We were spending five to six hours on a Sunday to have an hour, hour and 15 minute long service. Anybody can say amen to that? That was frustrating. <laughs> Completely wore me out. And uh, we, by nature, we were forced, because of that rhythm, we were forced, if we were going to do service projects within our community, we couldn't create our own. We didn't have enough time to, which I love now looking back on it. It forced us to be able to get with people who are already doing things that we felt God called us to do in our community, and we could just hop on with them. So if you're thinking about starting something, I would encourage you to hold off on it and maybe find other people who are in your community who are already doing that, that you can then just tether yourself to, give resource to, give volunteers to, and help them achieve that common goal, common purpose versus you starting something brand new. Does that make sense to everybody? Because uh, most times, uh, you know, like, man, I got this great idea, and there may be two or three other people in your community already doing that. You know, and you could just pick one or two that you want to go with and work with. So strategic partnerships are a win, a huge win. So, and some of those same strategic partners that we had back when we were mobile, now that we actually have a physical building, we still support and deal with them because they have our DNA. And that may not be true just for, I'm talking from the perspective of a church planter and starting churches, but you may have another ministry that God has called you to, and whatever that is, you still need to make sure that you have strategic partnerships. Be, uh, please avoid the idea that you've got to start everything from your own, your own bedroom, your own kitchen. You know, you don't have to do it that way. This, the, and the enemy will make you think that you're really not that spiritual. You know, or if you were really, if you really were going hard for God, you just create all the documentation yourself. No, you can steal it, rob it from people. I mean, no, don't, don't rob it. <laughs> but, you know, you can take snapshots, screenshots, take verbiage, language, do all that stuff, and make sure that you, you lean into someone else's work. You know, they've already done it, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I'll be the first to tell you that I've leaned into other people's work, and I'll continue to lean into other people's work. As long as God's called me to be bivocational, I don't have to start and create everything from scratch. That's, a, that's a, a, a travesty when I see people doing that. I know some people who are writing their own curriculum for their youth group, and they're bivocational. But why would you do that? You know, I had a guy who was, I was doing a, a wedding. This is no joke. I was doing a wedding with another pastor, bivocational. And he was writing the vows out, like, just like sitting down and taking half a day to, to write all the things. I was like, man, get you a ministry's help book. You know what I mean? And just, just use that. You know, we don't have to create all this stuff. And he felt like that he wasn't being authentic to the people he counseled, been prevailed on counsel, unless he <laughs> sat down and wrote them all out. I was like, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. That it just, and you know. All right, so team. Third. You're going to have to put energy in creating a team. Now, this is the long game, right? It's, it's incremental, and one of the things I love about being bivocational is that you have to have a team or you can't make it. Superman and superwoman are dead. And you need to make that like a mantra. Maybe tattoo it. If you get tattoos, tattoo it on you so that you realize that you don't have to be everything to all people all the time, and you need to invest in your team. If you're going to be working, you're going to be taking a 40-hour week somewhere else. Some, some other time is going to be, have to be required in another industry or another uh, career path for financial means. You're going to have to say, I'm going to be intentional about investing incrementally in my team. Because if you don't invest in this, you won't be able to sustain this, this pace at all. You've got to be able to have other people 
who were working alongside you who say, okay, pastor or leader or, or visionary, whatever it is that you're going to do, I'm going to come, I'm going to put some of my time and energy in with you, and you'll find yourself being able to do some things for a longer period of time when people would look at you and say, I thought by now you'd have fainted. Mm -hmm. I thought by now you'd have fell, fell apart and fell off. But it really <laughs> then depends on your team and how you grow them. This is slow going. Why? Because you're not going to be the type of guy who has access to his team or those individuals for eight hours a day like some leaders do. You may have an hour a week. You may have two and a half hours on a Sunday. You may have a two and a half hour or two hour staff meeting or whatever it is, but it's going to be hit and miss. You're going to jump in, get your time, jump in, get your time. And I'll tell you right now for the team that I have at the church, we've got eight people that are on the team. And four of them have been with me for over five or six years, and I feel like they are just now getting to a place that I would say, well, they're, they're stepping into some levels of maturity. So don't be under this, this pressure to feel like it, this has to happen in one year. Once the launch phase is over, then we've got to be ready to roll. And I know that's a model that we see in suburbia, but that's not necessarily true for the people that you're going to be working with in urban centers. If you're going to be bringing people from urban centers who, like we, we've been hearing some of the conversations, who may or may not have had leadership roles or responsibilities in their life, then that means that you're going to have to take this process the long game. Right. We're going to have to be building people step by step, here, there, a little, all along the way. Because I, I can't imagine uh, me saying that I'm going to be a church in an urban setting but I don't have any of the people who, who call themselves urban on my team. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you want to minister to people and the people that you want to minister to aren't actually in your leadership team, it's going to be hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm here to minister to you. It's us in a, uh, we're going to colonize. You know, I'm going to come in and we're going to make you better. But we won't ever think that you can get into a position where you can lead. Well, that's not real. That's not, that's not what I feel like the gospel says. And if we're going to take a, a picture of what Jesus did. He brought a whole bunch of people that other people probably wouldn't put on their team, and he had them walking real close with him for a long period of time. Right. And so I encourage that you would think about that too. Who's on your team, and are you investing in the people that you say that you're here to minister to in that particular community or context? You've got to be able to invest you got to do it early, start early, even when it's maybe one or two on your team. And you got to be consistent in it. And build self-margin in that. You just tell the team, listen, we won't always be like this. And the people who are at this table or at this desk or, or making decisions today won't always be here. But we're getting started. We're going to grow. We're going to bring new people on. And you just continue to vision cast like that. And, you, I, and you'll do better. That's one of the leverages, I would say, the benefits of being a bivocational leader because you have to build a team or you can't survive. Right. Lastly, I would just say it's empathy. I won't have you turn there, but in Ezekiel, the third chapter, Ezekiel has been tasked with going and speaking a tough word to the people of God. And God does something I think is phenomenal. If you, if you ever get a chance to read it, take a look at it. I think it's 3, verse 15 and 16. He tells Ezekiel to sit and to be still. Ezekiel sat for seven days. And initially, he was kind of fired up because God gave him a word. You ever felt like that? God told me to do this. I'm just, oh, here I go, man. The scripture says that in, 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 I think it's the King James Word. He said that he went in the heat of his spirit. So it was kind of the right thing, but from the wrong place. And he said, you know what, Ezekiel? I know you kind of got a word from me and you kind of excited. But as soon as he got down to the Kibar River in Tel Aviv, the Lord told him to sit in that place and to do life and just watch the people that he was going to go and minister to. This is a word of wisdom for anybody who's going to go into a particular people group that you may not be familiar with, the time to be able to sit and to identify with the people's issues, not sympathize, but empathize. So my last bit of leverage I would give to you and wisdom I would give to you is that your empathy will allow you to be able to preach harder and even more direct than you just coming in with knowledge. Because he sat. It also goes on to say that he was there with that people group for about 20 years. His sitting for seven days gave him the ability and the longevity to persevere for 20 years in a tough environment with people who were captive. You think about that. Empathy goes a long way. 
And if you've got empathy on board and you're willing to sit before you minister, if you're willing to listen and learn before you go teach, if you're willing to really identify with the issues, not just saying, well, I know that must be tough, but to really allow God to take your heart and put it in a place to where you can say, wow, I can feel that pain. You can minister to people and with such clarity and get so much more feedback and, and honest, really honestly fruit from a place of empathy. Your leverage is, is going to be that I have sat a, and I'm uniquely aware of that particular environment and those situations and those issues. Not just head knowledge, not just statistics, but genuinely knowing the people that God has called you to minister to. That would look like this. Whose house have you eaten in from the people you're going to be ministering to? Who have you sat down with and saw kind of what their day looks like as far as maybe being a whole household who has one car or no car? How have you really put yourself in those environments, those positions? Have you, how many conversations have you had? How many questions have you asked? How many people uh, have seen you in their circle, in their, you know, their, their rhythms, and not just, hey, I'm waiting for you to come to me? The Lord sent Ezekiel to that group of people. He was excited about going. He had a passion that was in the wrong place. And then God said, be still and learn. I don't know, but the scripture says that he was in distress after seven days. That he really started feeling the pain of the people. And it changed, I believe, the way he ministered to them. And that's it. If you're going to be in the room, you're going to have to be willing to do some hard things. If you're going to stay bivocational, you're going to have to stay sharp and crisp. And, the, and, and, and here's one thing that I'll share. People who are needing to be triaged, they need to feel like they're getting better because you're there. The difference, how many of you have ever been to the doctor? You went in and you sat, you know, your doctor, bedside manner is important, right? You go in and they make me feel good. They listen to me when we're actually sitting in the office. But how many of you know that your, uh, your doctor or your surgeon or physician behaves differently in the surgery room than they actually do in the office? I've had the opportunity to go and sit and look at some surgeries. And many of us will be performing some type of surgery as we go in with God's word to cut some things away, to bring some healing in some things. And when you're in the operating room, first and foremost, it's cold. It's sterile. They get down to business, and they're not as nice because you're under anesthesia. <laughs> right? You don't say ouch when they bend you in areas that your pain is. They bend you, flip you over, strap you down, and they got music playing, and they're getting busy. And they're just doing their thing. You don't necessarily see that or remember it. Thank God you don't see it or remember it. <laughs> but at the same time, from looking at that, it's way different from what we do on the follow-up. And we see the same doctor who was in there cutting, sawing maybe, uh, tearing things out, stitching, stitching things together, that's a different guy or gal when they actually come in and say, hey, how are you feeling? You take your medicine? We're going to start rehab in a week. But those are two different things. They're two different environments. The urban centers, and I'm not saying this to be derogatory to any urban centers, but it is more like a war zone than it is for us to be able to say we're just going to go in and you know, we're going to have a good time and have a whole bunch of bedside manners if we're having office visits, but this is more like surgery. Mm -hmm. This is more like surgery. Mm -hmm. We don't really can afford to maybe wait and have inferences and hope that people catch some things. We've got to be direct and get, tell me what I need to get better. What do I need to do to get healed? Empathy will help you be able to do that and get it across. You can have the right thing but the wrong delivery method and it never reaches where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. So, having said that, thank you guys for listening, paying close attention. We're going to open up for Q&A. So if you got any questions, our last 15 minutes or so, if you got questions, you got something that you, you know, I said something that sparked you, feel, please feel free to say something. We're going to, we're going to, I'm going to repeat the question so we can get it recorded here. And then we'll try to answer the best as possible. Yes. Uh, on that first point of being hardened, uh, two questions with that. Do you think that's more about just understanding the cultural context of the people that you're ministering to more so than, like, I don't know what hardened can be a broad term? Mm -hmm. And then two, are you as familiar with, like, these types of things in urban centers in other countries, like outside of just the North American 
One, I will say thank you for asking that question. The question was, uh, when it relates to harden, it's a broad term. Does harden mean that you're just aware of the unique uh, challenges within this, the people group that you may be ministering to? I think uh, yes, but also I think that uh, if you look at the first portion of Ezekiel, I'll just, I just answered the last portion of Ezekiel chapter 3. The scripture says that the Lord had to make Ezekiel's head hard before he went to go minister to the people. He said he made it hard like flint. And he had to give him a level of resolve so that he wouldn't give up when he encountered, you know, opposition or rejection. And so I think having a knowledge of the people group is definitely important. But at the same time, I think that we've got to realize that there will be some level of rejection uh, that we experience when we go out and share the gospel. And I think that's a hard thing that we have to do. Because when we go to do good things and those good things that we go to do hurt, Sometimes we question why are we doing those things if they're hurting us, you know. And so I hope that helps. Hardening not just uh, of our resolve, not our heart. We don't want to harden our heart, but we just want to make sure that our resolve is right. And then uh, lastly, the question you asked about uh, in other urban environments, I can't talk about that. Uh, it'd be wrong for me to try to pretend like I've been out of the country and done, seen this in other areas. I can only talk about what I know. And so uh, you'd have to ask somebody else about that specifically. Yes. Yeah, you talked about how you experience pace. Yes. And so, you know, often the pace of the culture is already very fast. So, like, you're trying to do two things at the same time, so you're just, like, really falling, or it's really easy to fall in. And so you talked about 2014 and how that was going on. So what were your, like, red lights, and how did you, like, what was your thought through that process, and where do I slow down? You know, when you're doing two things, where do you cut? That's always the question. So, like, can you walk us through your experience with that? Yeah. Well, in 2014, uh, I had been pastoring at that time for five years. You know, uh, five years in, in my pastorate, I was 14. No, I'll take that back. I'm glad my wife's not here. I was 17 years into marriage, and I had, I had, all my kids were you know, getting to become teenagers at the time. Uh, the signs that I ignored was poor self-talk. You know, some red flags for me now that I look back on it. You know, the way that I was communicating with myself had gotten very dark. I fantasized, I fantasized more than I probably should about quitting than actually keeping going or starting. I, I had this ongoing, the only thing that I could control is the fact that I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna quit here, I'm gonna quit, you know, that was one of the number one things that I ignored. Oh, you know, because I come from a sports background, and the sports background tells you just keep going. You know what I mean? You know, it's fourth quarter, toughen up. You know what I mean? Let's go. We got the next play, next play. And that probably did me more harm than good. I fantasize about quitting so much to where the Holy Spirit, I feel the Holy Spirit just tell me, you know what? I want you to stop that. You know what I mean? Just flat out, it was just like, wasn't a whole bunch of conversation, just stop that. And I was like, Okay, and it kind of it kind of woke me up in some ways, but I didn't stop. Uh, I kept I kept kind of having that same conversation. That was coming the red flags. So I ignored my wife. You know, you may, you may not be married, you may not have a significant other, but someone's really close to you. I didn't have a a really good network of people who could say, Hey, Gates, you're getting out of bounds, man. Like you, have you taken a break lately? I mean, have you? I didn't have anybody that was saying that, right? Mm. And so that was kind of a closed loop that I didn't do a good job of inviting other people in. Uh, I was dealing with secondary trauma from always kind of being everyone else's 911. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? Yeah. I was dealing with it heavy. And uh, I, it ended up wearing me out. I just, I could, it was a slow fade. It was a little bit here, a little bit here. And I could never, while I, while I was in it, I couldn't see when. You know, it was only when I got to the point of, hey, you need to go talk to somebody. You need to get some counseling. You need to find, it. you know, it's only when I got there that I realized that, oh, wow, it, it had gotten that bad. And law enforcement would do that to you, too, you know, which was a double whammy for me. And then not only that, I was working in the community that there was a lot of felt need. You know, there was a lot of, you know, well, you know, my light's about to get cut out. You know, I lost my kids. I mean, so that just kept on becoming the, the it was the norm 
but it wasn't healthy for me to continue to expose myself to it. And so I went and talked to people, went and got counseling. Uh, just, just being able to sit and talk to somebody who didn't have any skin in the game and just say, this is what's going on. It's Christian faith-based counseling. And uh, it really helped bring me back out of it. Of course, prayer, not, we had some concentrated prayer time, 21 days of prayer and some counseling helped bring me back up to where I was above water. Uh, but I would say that the self-talk become negative and I was really thinking about quitting too much uh, and not having anybody in my life who was able to tell me like, hey, you're going too fast. And just being, being available too much, too many phone calls all the time, text messages and emails, it was just, I took my job, I took some of the principles of law enforcement and brought them into the faith-based community and it wasn't healthy. So I, as soon as I would get a call, I'd be like, hey, I'm on my way. You know what I mean? Kind of like you would want your law enforcement community to do. And I, I didn't know how to prioritize those things and put boundaries on it. I hope that helps in any way. And so, like, probably everything was really important. Uh, like, just pointers on what you learned to that priority kind of thing. What am, what am I saying? What, what am I going to say no to? Yeah. Where everybody, everything is so important. Yeah. Well, one, I started taking regular scheduled breaks, right? Uh, just put it on the calendar as if though it was a to-do list. You know, I, and I know that's hard. I, I was the worst at it, but you got to do that, right? And I was saying no to things that could wait. So I, in my own mind, I had a triage system. Uh, Will will them needing to wait to the next time I'm in the office or the next next time I'm in the office for counseling? If I tell them to wait, will there be uh, will there be a crime committed? Oh, this is my mind. You know, like, will somebody commit a crime against somebody else? Will will uh, someone's life be in risk? You know, those things I wouldn't say no to. Right? I mean, if someone down their sick bed was there an accident and injury? Okay, I'm gonna deal with those. Uh, hey, me and my husband just got into an argument. Okay, you guys have been arguing for the last 15 years. We'll get together on Wednesday, right? You know, that type of thing. I had to be able to differentiate. Everyone's a little bit different on that regard. But I would encourage you to maybe sit down with another seasoned leader that would be able to help you say, this is important, like right now stuff, and this is maybe something that you could put off to where you're regularly available to help meet those needs and not be driving 90 miles an hour to go to a, you know, someone stubbed their toe and they need you, you know, so. Mm -hmm. But I would, those are the, that's the way I did it. Was criminal activity going on that I need to jump into? Uh, was someone's life at risk? Was someone in the hospital like right now? Uh, and I, I'll tell you this, I didn't even go, I don't go to the hospital unless they get admitted now. So that's just another thing that you may you may just, as pastoral care, like it. Are they in the ER? Yeah, they are. Okay, let me know if they get admitted. Mm -hmm. Right? They get a room, then I'll show up for most cases. Now, every case is a little bit different, but you, you can kind of use that as a rule of thumb that, that I use, and you can modify it as you see fit. But I hope that helps. Anyone else got any questions? We've got a couple more minutes. I got something to piggyback off of kind of pace. Yeah. Sabbath. Like, what is that? Can you kind of speak to the importance of Sabbath? Yeah. I'm bivocational and kind of for me, uh, didn't really have Sabbath as a rhythm until I became bivocational and really that was like yeah. for me the, the refresh and rejuvenation and kind of, so yeah, if you could just speak kind of with pace, like what does Sabbath look like, the importance of Sabbath? Well, I, I'll first just say, I'll say this to start off before answering that. You've got to get rid of the guilt that comes with feeling like you know, I, I shouldn't be taking a break. You know, you got to get rid of that. Hmm. You got to get rid of that guilt that comes with that. You need to be, you need to be safe and careful with your with your own life, and I, I, I mean that with your time. And so, Sabbath for me now is like a Monday, versus being like a Sunday because I, you know, I work Monday through Friday, and then I do things on Saturday to prepare for Sunday, and then Sunday I'm, you know, so Monday or Tuesday is a day that I would normally take off. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with taking two days off, you know, and, hey, if you need to. It, it, it just keeping a healthy rhythm. Mm. But I take a day off during the week like that to where I'm not doing anything, I'm not going to put anything in the calendar, and it has to stay there, you know. Uh, and you can fill it with other stuff, you could, other things that give you energy. So I'm not saying you got to sit in a chair and be like numb, you know, a vegetable to really be savvy. I mean, you could be out repairing your car. It gives you energy. 
whatever it is that gives you energy back, you need to put that in that time spot. So if you want to go fishing, if you want to ride bikes, whatever, whatever it is, you need to put something in that place that then gives you fuel, right? And it may mean that you sleep in and you don't get out of bed. That, that may be it. But, amen. <laughs> it may be that. But at the same time, it may be that, you know, you, you like to go visit museums and you take a day to go to the museum. I don't know. Whatever it is, I think it has to be something that gives you energy back. Uh, because it's, we're playing with bank accounts, right? You know, so how much I have, how much I don't have. The reason why I got in trouble is because I was on E, you know, really below E. Right, and I wasn't doing enough to put back in, uh, so that I could give back out. And that's important. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, man. Yeah. Anyone else? I thought I saw a hand up. Yes. Uh, like for people who are talking about getting into church planting, what kind of team did you form, that, and how did they help you? Are uh, you getting into church planting, and you want to know what type of team I formed? Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you this. This is probably just <laughs> listen. I didn't go to Central Casting to pick my teammates. Mm -hmm. You know how that is, like, well, I'm going to get the tall one, and I'm going to get the one that's got the, the great resume, and, you know, I, for me to pick my teammates, uh, I just let the Lord determine who my teammates going to be by who showed up, mm. yeah. right? I, I didn't, whoever showed up, I'm working with them, right? Mm. And so that means there's some people who have no training, there's people who come from a lot of training, and to really be honest with you, I'm kind of glad that God didn't send me some people who were too strong in the very beginning. And, if, and this is why, because if they, if they would have sent me some people who were too strong in the very beginning, then their leadership would have trumped my ability, and we would have probably been working on them, even without them intentionally being, you know, trying to take over or anything. If they would have been so strong with me not being clear on vision, with me not really having a good philosophy, with me not having some things that I need to have deep down inside, I knew were there, but I hadn't really extracted them, I hadn't really taken them out, it was good that God brought people who were who were, they were pliable enough to, for me to be able to make the mistakes that I was going to make yeah. mm -hmm. and continue on, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I encourage you to, to work, of course, pray, you know, but then at the same time, I, I feel that God tells you a lot about what he's going to do in your life by who he brings into your life. Mm -hmm. So if he brings in the very beginning, hey, we're launching, and you've got this particular group that shows up and says, we're going to start with this group, then that's God saying that this is who, you, this is who and what I'm doing in you and through your ministry. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So don't despise that. Like you got to go and, you know, ask someone who's better qualified to help. But uh, you can do that too. But I would just encourage you to, to consider that God may be doing something very intentional by bringing you that particular group at that particular season. And you know what they say. The people that start with you won't stay with you anyway. Mm -hmm. So you can get out there and think that this is the rock star team. They're going to be here forever. I would encourage you not to have that type of always and forever language with your team in the first place mm -hmm. because that would almost prevent you from being able to let go of some people that should be gone. If you continue on with that language, they'll feel like that God called me here forever and they really may only be there for a season to help you in a particular way. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, I know like when we look at Paul, like, he kind of flip flops back and forth between bivocational and like not bivocational. And I know you mentioned that. Say know, that first part again. I know like when we look at like Apostle Paul, like Apostle he kind Paul, of yeah. flips back and forth between bivocational and not doing bivocational. And I know you mentioned that you were in a position where you had to be bivocational. Yeah. Do you think for people that are in positions where they have the choice of like not being bivocational or being bivocational, they should choose it as a strategy per se? Or, or no? Just kind of curious your thoughts on that. Uh, this is the question was whether or not we should, if we have the option of being bivocational or not bivocational, should we choose either one? And if so, why? why? Uh, I think as it relates to the urban community and what I know about offerings, you know, can we talk just honestly about resource? Okay. What I know about offering and what I know about the urban community, the, normally they're not resource rich in that way. So if you're going to go into city centers and deal with the underserved, underserved and under-resourced, mm. you may want to just think about the idea of, do I want to make a third of my budget my salary? Mm. Right? Do I want to make half of the budget my salary? That, that you know, your effectiveness, yes, you're important to the whole thing. I, you know what I mean? I'm not going to ever knock that, and you're worth your hire, right? Don't muzzle you. But if you're going to be able to, to be effective in ministry, if 50% of everything that comes in is going to, but to salaries in general, it just kind of puts a damper on what you can do within your community. 
right? So I think you should you should be working towards things and moving incrementally up. But I also think that if you're going to be in city cities like that, and everybody's unique. So when I say this, this isn't a blanket statement. So if you got a really generous congregation, then great. But we identify urban leaders as as world impact. We identify urban leaders who are bivocational. They're not classically trained. They're resourced internally just by the people who were there. They, uh, they're meeting in non-traditional spaces and non-traditional times. Rec centers, homes, office buildings, outside, people's garages, you know, that type of thing. And they're not tethered. They're non-denominational. You don't have to check all those boxes, but you may check some of those. And so if you're wondering, like, how do I know if I'm urban or not, uh, I would maybe use that as a filter to, to kind of start with, you know. Uh, and it's not, like I said, it's not hard and fast, but you may find yourself being like, you know what, well, that's really what God's called me to be. And if that's where he, he called you, then do it. But it depends on everybody's situation. It's a little bit unique. I think you should be willing to be bivocational, though. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, what do you think is a better, or what are your thoughts on how we can do better to make bivocational pastors like, seem like they're actually real pastors and not just kind of second class citizens. Uh, how can the church do better? I mean, I've been thinking a lot about that, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, that, well, how can we do better to make bivocational pastors feel like they're, they're really pastors? You know, air quotes there. Uh, I think... One, validation and affirmation is always important by our suburban partners, For in my opinion. I've had plenty of, uh, when we were tiny and small, I mean, we had like 25 people showing up, and I had some uh, suburban pastors and or other urban pastors show up, and they were just like, yeah, I'm coming to see your church. And just by them even saying that, it kind of made me feel like, yeah, I, I mean, we are a church, you know, even though we're like in this embryonic stage, that someone being able to validate you in seed form is important. Uh, I don't know if there's a one-size-fits-all for that. I do think that just even by our very nature being here today at this conference, it gives us the ability to see the value in the city, the value in, in people who are pastoring in uh, these communities that many people may not ever know that you even exist as a church. You don't have a storefront. You don't have a sign. You don't have anything that, that, that would say that I'm here other than maybe like something you put out on a Sunday morning. I mean, as a church, we existed for like four or five years, and I know nobody knew we existed because if they didn't get up on a Sunday morning and drive down that one particular street, they would have never saw my sign, right? And so, and my sign was like one of those little bitty, like, you know, I didn't have one of the big neon signs. So those things are important, and people being able to validate you that are already in ministry is huge. Uh, that's why I think that you should have a network, a spiritual network, that you're not out by yourself anyway. Right, so you got to have somebody who's been in the game a little bit longer than you, that'll be able to just encourage you by even identifying with some of your, I would say, seasonal woes. Like you're in this season, yeah, I've been there too, and they're just helping, just affirm you because you may not get everybody to say, oh, they're legitimate or whatever else. But I will say, longevity does help. So you know, and and that's just what people are looking at. It's kind of show me thing. There's a lot of churches that start, and when there's a lot of churches that stop, and so people are just need to make sure that that's. A genuine thing. I hope that clarifies it. I don't think there's one word that I would be able to use to say that we need to do this. But I do know this, that the, the civic health of communities, to me, and, and are not tethered on how many jobs are created. They're not tethered on uh, uh, transportation uh, within a community. But really how our civic health is designed solely to be a reflection of our spiritual health and what's going on at that grassroots level in environments that the government can't fix what's going on in my neighborhood. You know, that really, that says a lot about what we, we think about the church, and especially the church amongst the underserved. Yeah. One last question and I'm done, if you have one. All right, great. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. Thank I you. appreciate it. I hope this was good for you. Good, if you got anything else, you have I hope you have a great rest of your conference.